welcome everybody. Good evening and welcome to the hot new episode today on The Voice Live with Sandy. Today we're going to discuss about busting through mindset blocks, high converting feminine sales method, and wealth creation strategies with our very special guest, Michelle Bloom. Please allow me to introduce you to Michelle. Michelle is known for financial well-being specialist and an amazing coach based in Brisbane, Australia. At the young age of 26, Michelle was promoted to international sales and training manager at Vocom Health and Safety. What well, that's an accomplishment at that age, Michelle. <laughs> and for this role, she moved to London and managed 15 offices across the globe. Wow, that's amazing at 26 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, armed with this solid foundation of sales and a passion to train, teach, and lead, Michelle joined Action International, where she learned about business development and marketing by watching how a business needs to constantly evolve. That was when she knew that she would make coaching and teaching a big part of her own business someday. When she moved to the Gold Coast, Australia, she started a new phase by selling a phase of life by selling financial products, which rounded her desires and ability to grow her own business. Michelle and her husband started a caravan repair and custom built motor home business. Within 18 months, her business was generating over 1.2 million a year. Wow. But while she was ex enjoying external success, she was feeling something was missing. She embarked on a personal fulfillment journey and received certifications in life coaching, conscious hypnosis, neural linguistic programming, and she founded Time to Bloom Sales and Business Coaching, focusing on helping female tra soul trade with the skills with the skills gaps in sales and marketing. Michelle also earned her diploma in financial planning and became a superannuation specialist in 2015, which she brought to her position as Senior Financial Wellbeing Specialist at Forward Wealth. She then decided to start Proactive Wealth Group with her son, Arthur MacArthur, Aaron MacArthur? Aaron. Aaron <laughs> MacArthur, who was also a financial advisor. So like many women out there, Michelle has also experienced many tra emotional traumas in her life from childhood domestic violence, teen rape, and her divorce from a narcissistic cheating husband, which left her broken and having to rebuild her life from scratch. Thus, she shares, she shares her story openly to help other women to overcome their unhealed wounds combined with her practical no-nonsense style. Michelle and I met when we joined the Mafia Academy. We always have a joke about the Mafia Academy. Everyone's like, the what? The Mafia? <laughs> <laughs> so immediately, Michelle and I both knew that we shared similar experiences from childhood abuse to domestic violence and divorce from narcissistic partners. Hi, Michelle. Again, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Yes, it no, is Saturday in you. Spain. So how are you yeah. today? Awesome. It's a beautiful day here on the Gold Coast. Sun is shining, the rain has stopped, and yeah, beautiful day. So, Michelle, tell us who are you? Well, we, I mean, I've read all these the, yeah. <laughs> good things about you, but you tell us who are you? Yes, that was my whole speaker bio. So, yeah, that, that pretty much covers it. So, we can leave now, we're done. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so as you said, um, I'm 50 now, so I've had like 30 odd years in business development, um, sales training, coaching, um, business coaching, and over the last seven years, um, financial services. And um, so I've been in that industry seven years, and that's what I guess drove me to sort of into more of the money mindset coaching. Because um, I was finding, uh, as you mentioned, that looking for fulfillment didn't come from external success. So when I was over in the UK at you know 26, and then the business with um, the ex-husband, um, there was still something missing, which has got me into the, the, the coaching side of thing to be able to help and empower women. 
And when I first started, I started in sales coaching because I'd been an ex-sales trainer. I thought that was a natural niche to go into. Um, but then after my personal story of, um, you know, going from uh, a seven-figure business owner to divorced and uh, broken, broken uh, on both ends and having to go back to um, square one, it just felt like a calling then to help other women to prevent that from happening to them. And if they do need to rebuild, to be able to rebuild um, using the three pillars that I cover in my one-to-one -one coaching and programs. So tell us, I mean, I know I relate to that. I relate to having to start from scratch and I, and I relate to having nothing that I walked away from everything. So I definitely relate to what you're saying. So Michelle, tell us about why are you passionate about this? So when I um, walked away from the marriage and the seven figure business, um, we had the agreement that I would keep the house, um, but he would you know, keep the business, but he'd racked up that much debt. There was nothing left in it. And so, as I said, I had to start from um, scratch. And the reason I'm passionate about helping women is because none of us have a crystal ball. We don't see these things coming around the corner. So setting ourselves up financially is just so important. And so many of the clients, uh, both financial planning and coaching clients are women that have been divorced, had to start from scratch and are really anxious and concerned about their financial future. And most of them are self-employed and most of them are um, sort of in the coaching, consulting, service providing um, area. And because of those, it's those three pillars that really need to be worked on um, to make sure that they're okay long term. And if I can help women with the financial planning strategies to make sure that they are going to be okay in retirement, because 50% of, I don't know the, the stats um, in, in Canada, but in Australia, 50% of women um, worry about their retirement. They retire with two thirds less than what men do. And they are the fastest retired divorced women are the fastest demographic of homelessness in Australia, I think, which is pretty scary. Yeah, that is very scary. And I, I totally understand that. Um, you know, like, like you said, it, women are more worried about things than men. I, I, I totally get that. So yeah. why don't you tell us a bit about the money architect and how it works? Yep. So I work with three different pillars and uh, pillar one is money mindset mastery. And step one of that is there's eight different uh, money archetypes, just like there are, um, if anyone's ever done extended disc or Myers-Briggs personality profiling, there's actually eight different money archetypes and they're essentially your money DNA or your money blueprint or money personality type. And there's eight of them. So when you do the assessment, um, there's about 60 questions and just like Myers-Briggs or extended disc, you can't trick them. So it comes up with your different um, archetype. And so they're like these beautiful cards and it, yeah, yeah. And each one covers everything um, from certain personality traits and there's each one also has its own um, strengths. And they also have their own blind spot or weaknesses. And so for a lot of coaches, for example, the connector, uh, because they are so community-based and they're passionate about giving and contributing, however, they feel guilt when it comes to charging money. So they, they women are, cons are chronic undercharges and undervaluing themselves. And especially if they're a connector, because for them, it's all about the giving. And so the way I work with those women is to understand that the more, the more money they're making, the more impact they can have. It's that butterfly effect. And that if they're coaching their clients through the same things, that that will then have that roll on effect um, as well. So it's all about reframing and, um, and that sort of stuff. Each one has its own sacred money contract. Um, yeah, so for example, a connector um, can feel overwhelmed with basic financial um, details, lack of financial independence, not feeling empowered with money. That's their, their challenges.
but their, stre their strengths are trusting, innocent, resilient, um, and they don't overly stress about what it that can be the opposite where they don't worry about it. it's a she'll be right mate type of attitude and can then them you know into a um a not so empowered state um whereas an accumulator is very detail orientated and they love looking at the numbers they're savers they love saving uh, and things like that but they also have their challenges um as well so they can be obsessive or compulsive or feeling uh, guilt or doubt about investing things like that and the nurturer which is one of mine is can have weak money boundaries so when it comes to people we love we can have weak, weak money boundaries about rescuing and things like that but on the inside it creates resentment um, and a bit of martyrdom and things like that so knowing what your archetype is out of the eight and then being coached through the action steps to strengthen the blind spots and, and the, the challenging areas and playing to the, the strengths. But there's lots of aha moments when people do the, um, you know, do their, do their assessment. And then we use tools to actually, um, yeah, reframe their money beliefs and, and those sorts of stuff. Well, I know, I wish I had that when I was, you know, when I had left, because I had no clue. Um, first of all, when I got married, um, I didn't know anything about money at all because my parents yeah. sheltered us too much. So mm -hmm. we didn't know anything about paying bills or, you know, nothing at all. I didn't know how to manage a mortgage. I didn't know how to, so, and then after I left, um, I still didn't know that much because, you know, uh, things were shared, things were shared with the in-laws. So I didn't know that much and, and it, I, had, I had to learn very fast. So I wish I had you then. <laughs> I wasn't taught that when I was young either. It's not something we were taught at school. It's not something my parents taught me. Um, you have to sort of figure it out on your own. And yeah, and even though um, I mean, I I worked. I did not work in the financial sector at all. Um, I hated math. I still hate math. Yeah. Even though I do budgets for a living now. I mean, I used to you do budget yeah. investment investments now. Um, I did not like math, so for me, it was not something mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. So financials was not my uh my strongest point at all and a lot of women too i know that a lot of women uh are not that um in depth especially in our culture because mm -hmm. in our culture the the men always take care of the bill yeah so i don't you... might be changing now but i think there's you know a lot in in all cultures that are very similar i don't i think it's more yeah um things are changing that people taking yeah. responsibility yeah yeah i know i speak to a lot of people in australia as well and a lot of the things that um that we have in our culture you guys have the same kind of um uh perceptions and i think mm -hmm. it comes from being a uh, rule by the british <laughs> at one time yeah so i um, i have here on my notes um you had about um how to how to avoid um what how to avoid the seven common mistakes causing women to be left struggling at the age of pension in poverty yes so that is yeah that's off my but so there are three different speaker topics that i had on there so that the point is is like a whole one hour um presentation but basically what that is about is and the, it would apply the strategy would be different but um what a lot of self-employed women do and especially if they're in the, the you know the coaching consulting service providing um, uh, area being self-employed a lot of women don't put money into their superannuation or is it for a, is your 401k the same as us yeah um, by not putting money away for that and and if they're not investing either they can get to retirement and really end up in a you know a bit of a pickle mm -hmm. um and if they're not building a brand that they can, or a, a, a corporate type of thing that, that is becomes a sellable asset, and they just then decide to retire at some point, whether that be at 60 or whether it's 75, you know, a lot of women say, oh no, I'll keep doing it forever because I love doing it so much. Well, th there's gonna come a time when you can't. Yeah. And so if you don't have that money put um, away, 
and have it accumulating and working harder for you, yeah, it's it's not going to be good because if they're if they're just a, an independent um, coach, then and it's not a <clears throat> pardon me, a sellable asset, and they just stop working. Well, the income stops, and there's nothing there for that nest egg. Here in Australia, one of the products that um, we do with our financial planning firm is uh, what they call a wholesale type superannuation, which performs at about four percent higher than the industry funds. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that um, over a 10, 15 year period, that can double or even triple their retirement nest egg. So if they've found themselves divorced um, and no longer have a home or they've had time off with kids, raising kids and things like that, and so their balance is lower, this helps give it that boost without it affecting their lifestyle. And they can also have the portfolio outside soup. So it returns 14% uh, as a five year average. They can also have it outside super because they're meaning that they can access it whenever they want. They don't have to wait till retirement because a lot of our financial planning clients, if they have had a divorce settlement, they'll have the money sitting in, in the bank as cash, a couple of hundred thousand sitting there, but they don't know what to do with it because they don't have the confidence to invest. Invest. Um, yeah. 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 So it sits there getting zero interest. Whereas yeah. it could be getting 14% and they don't need to worry about managing it. So that's two yeah. strategies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the that's the finance, that's pillar three. Um, and that's a whole presentation up on that. But yeah, so having those financial planning strategies to make sure that they're not paying too much tax and that they are paying themselves first and paying into their super or their uh, 401k. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. Like for, for me, I, I didn't know much about finances, like I said, but the one thing that I did when I was at work was I started to buy um, the, the bonds mm -hmm. at work. And that was um, a big help in getting me started to buy a home when I, when I left because I left without anything. So any advice for um, like, what would you say to someone who is about to get separated or divorced? I know um, if, if you, you know, if people out there are thinking about a divorce, you'll need to make many important decisions, such as where you want to live or how you manage your financials, or if you have children, they might be your first priority. So as a first step to learn about your rights and responsibilities in regards to financials, uh, you know, in Canada, some of the family laws um are federal while others are provincial and i don't know if it's the same in australia so uh, here it's very important that we follow the family law which applies to the jurisdiction that we're in so we live in yeah. ontario and there's so many different um family laws that are different in alberta or in another province so it's very important for us in you know like to be able to follow the family law we put our children as a priority but we also need to, to learn about our rights and responsibilities. And for me, I know that, um, I feel that it's our right as a parent to take care of our children financially. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, the children didn't choose for you to get a divorce. The children didn't choose for you to be in that situation. And I feel it's, if you're concerned, like, <laughs> like for me, that was my priority, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, my advice would be, like, well, I'm not a, a lawyer and or anything <clears throat> to do with, you know, divorce law or anything like that, but I guess my advice would be to um, go and see a financial advisor and so that you have an idea of how you're situated. Um, an advisor can also help you access, um, so superannuation is a, a splittable asset like a house or anything like that. So if one person's got 300,000 and the other one's got, you know, 200,000, so total of 500 between them, it gets split down the middle. And the laws have changed now that the advisor can actually um, access the other person's superannuation details because it used to, they used to make it difficult. So you didn't know exactly how much your partner had in super. And when you're going through such an emotional time, it can all just feel too hard. and you know, or that they don't want to, um, you know, take the person's, some of the person's super and all that sort of stuff. But if you've been home raising kids, you've been working and yeah. you need to make sure you're okay and letting go of that guilt uh, around actually doing that. Um, so go and see an advisor and find out how you can best maximise, um, work out exactly some how much you're going to uh, have approximately and then 
put a plan in place and structure um, in place. And if you can get a mediator um, or, you know, yes, lawyers are expensive, but I am finding a lot of women uh, sometimes then walking away because it just gets too hard. And I was one of those women being with a, 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 a narcissist. Um, you just wanted it to be over. So I said, yep, okay, you keep the business, I'll keep the house. Um, but I had purchased the house prior. What I didn't realise that by the time everything was said and done, I was going to have bugger all left to actually start again. Yet he still got that business running six, seven years later. You know, so um, I was also entitled to spousal support. Um, and I didn't know that. If I'd had a lawyer, I would have known that. And so, yeah, walked away because you just, it just feels also too hard and that sort of thing. So it is worth getting the advice and the mediation um, because they will you know, advocate for you and make sure you don't get taken advantage of. Um, yes, it will cost you money, but in the long run, if it makes you, well, not makes you, but you know, allows you to have hundreds of thousands more or whatever it might be, then it's worth it and gives yeah. you a piece of mind knowing that you yeah. did everything. I mean, if you can do it through mediation, it's probably better. But if you can't mm -hmm. find a resolution, I would definitely encourage you to, to contact a lawyer because, you know, with they know the family law. And in Canada recently, I think last year, March, yeah, 2001, the Divorce Act in Ontario changed um, um, slightly. There's no, there's no changes on the grounds for divorce or how to mm -hmm. apply for a divorce. But the biggest difference in the change is in the terminology. The Act mm -hmm. now uses parenting arrangements and it used to formally be custody or access. So now they're yeah. using parent parenting arrangements to describe mm -hmm. where the children will live and how how the decisions are made about the children's well being. Yeah. And then the yeah. other thing that that you have to look at is child support. Mm -hmm. You know, child support needs financial support from both parents, and they have and a getting legal that in writing. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, when it starts, even if it's fairly amicable to begin with, it can change. So I had an agreement with my first husband and the husband of my children um, that he was going to, you know, pay hundred dollars a week uh, child support, and he just stopped. It lasted maybe three months, three or four months. It just stopped. So I raised them with zero support because I never got it in writing. I never got, it. and I started off fair of, you know, split the house 50-50. I could have taken eighty percent. Again, didn't get advice. I could have had eighty percent, um, but it just stopped, and then. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, did I, stuff I know. to avoid pain. Yeah, yeah. So it can so start I, off amicable yeah. and then change. Yeah, I mean, if you if you read my book, um, it you'll, it'll tell you about twice. I um, it, you know, like the book is very similar to my to my situation, and I mm -hmm. had that twice happen to me. And the yeah. first for the first three children, I had zero, mm -hmm. zero support. I actually had to turn around because at one point in time, um, my ex-husband and his father, um, well, it was his father, actually, they got custody for six months for my older daughter. And it was just mm -hmm. the weirdest thing because I have three children with this person. And here they was, took one child out of the, of, of the three, like one child. Yeah. I, I have no clue why that was. And that's got to be I don't know. I always thought that maybe they were bribing the judge or something because the one child and she didn't want to go at the time, you know, um, and then I ended up paying support. He that really happened to me. Support. And all yes. the time that I had the children, I ended up paying child support for her when she lived there. And mm -hmm. uh, thank God, like I, I never told the children when they, when they were younger, but as they grew up, I kept every single copy of the checks that I that I made up to them. So I can show the kids when they grow up that I did pay child support, although yeah. he never did. And then with the second one, um, and you know, in my second relationship, um, I was married to a man of the law. He mm -hmm. was um, like a federal, a federal police officer, right? And he didn't want to pay child support. He mm -hmm. he refused to go. So then I had to take it to court, and I didn't want to go to court for that because I've been there, done that with three kids already. <laughs> right i didn't want to do yeah. it again 
So, but I had to because he he was gonna pay me $150. Here was this man making about $120,000 a year, and he wants to give me $150 a month for the kid. Yeah. So when we went to court, the the the, the judge he actually you know he's like, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> you're a man of the law, and you're here like that's yeah. ridiculous. You know, yeah. so try and and make sure you know what your rights are. And mm -hmm. because when parents are separating or divorcing, they should agree on what the amount of the child support is if you're going to mediate. Because there is in Ontario, I don't know if in Australia they have that, but it's uh, you can even find it on the internet. There's a calculation by income. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get half of, of what he's supposed to be paying me because I just agreed to whatever he said in court and, and that was the end of it. And he paid me that same amount until my child finished university the same yeah. amount from two years old mm. and I never asked him for anything else I just didn't I didn't care I was fine I didn't want I didn't want it but you know if you're in a situation where you need it fight for it yeah the court will decide it you know I agree yes very much so and there's guidelines that, that depends on family situations and the website that, you know, the government website, and I'm sure that the Australia has the same thing with the, the Divorce Act and the federal support guidelines. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all on the internet, so you, it's easy to find. So, yeah. and then, you know, like there's spousal support, like what the heck is that about? <laughs> Some women have to pay spousal support. Mm. Yeah. So very um silly system. That's yeah, not gonna happen and, to and me. I I find that's like basically from a narcissistic point of view, right? Spousal mm -hmm. support is money paid by one spouse to another after they separate or divorce, and it it's also called alimony. We call it here in in Ontario spousal support, um, mm -hmm. but it's also called alimony or maintenance, right? Like what are you maintaining? Um, yes, but yeah. many factors may affect whether or not. Um, a married couple or a married spouse is entitled to spousal support. And as you had mentioned earlier, um, women who stay at home and took care of the children, like that that's a big thing that they should be looking into is the spousal support and how much that they should be receiving because they, they were working, they were taking care of the children. They're, they're homemakers, they took care of the yeah. home. So mm -hmm. I feel that that, you know, it, they should be looking into that as well if that's yeah. something that yeah yeah so for me i um i don't know i how, how do you feel about um about women stepping out into you know on their own and having to financially maintain a home alone alone um well i mean as a single income i don't oh. did that so i know yeah yeah if you're using um budgeting tools and things like that just to i mean there's a rental crisis here at the moment which is tough because the and to be honest i don't have an answer for it on that one you know the the there's a rental crisis and rent has gone up something like 20 odd percent and people are offering to pay six months in advance um and things like that so having to move further out where it's a little bit cheaper um yeah because if they're if i mean look if i had to pay rent um as a, as a single mother right now it, it would be tough you know, you know? It's, it's, it's expensive and even getting a place in the first place is tough so whether or not it's um uh, sharing with um, um somebody else like if getting a renting out one room um or having to move further out um could be a solution uh, as well and having your budgets and making sure that you, you know that there's not money being um, wasted and cutting back where you can. Um, paying down if there's any any debt, paying down the smallest ones first. A lot of people think you pay the biggest one off first. If you pay the smallest one um, off first, it gives you that those little wins. And then what used to be back that being paid off debt, let's say you've got um, you know, a, a $5,000 debt and a, a $10,000 debt. So if you're paying off the $5,000 debt first, gives you that, you know, feeling obviously of, of, that you've accomplished something. And then the money that you've paid were paying off that first debt can then go off the second one. 
okay? The other thing is to pay yourself first. So what people tend to do, savings and that sort of thing in reverse. So they will, um, you know, pay their, uh, obviously their, their rent and their, um, uh, their bills and then their spending money and then save what's left. So if you save 10% first and then to pay yourself first into your savings and then everything else has to align with that. So whatever you got left means how much you can work out in your budget of how much you can spend on rent and food and shopping um, and all those sorts of things. If it's a really, uh, if, if it's a low income and there's just no money for savings, um, depending on whether or not if you're in a, uh, a job or a career and you can look at upskilling to get a pay rise or a second job or, um, you know, that sort of thing. And if in business, as I said, women are chronic undercharges mm -hmm. and undervaluing um, what mm -hmm. they what they do. Yeah. And they tend to work out their prices on, okay, I'm offering X amount of one-to-one -one sessions. If uh should be $50 an hour and rather than on the value of the transformation. You know, I have, have done that so many times. Yeah. Um, but before, like when I, so when I was single, I had, well, I had, I was a single mom with four children and I had two, I had two part-time jobs. So I was doing uh, um, the wedding business. I was doing a cleaning business and I was teaching dance at the same time. But I find I found all these things because I needed the the extra income, especially from the wedding business. But then here I was looking at these two young people getting married, and Indian weddings are very expensive. And I was underselling my 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 myself the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like every time somebody came up to me, oh, I can't afford it because you know we have this to pay and we have that. And I still do this up to now. I I still feel sorry for the for the bride and the groom because I'm thinking, oh my God, they're just starting out in their lives and and I should give them a discount. And so I undersell yep. myself all the time. Yeah. They tend to women tend to immediately discount. They might say, oh, so my, you know, my my program is um is three thousand dollars, but I can do it for you for two. Yeah. And so if, if they're already undercharging and then immediately discounting, they don't even uh, some of them won't even give the client the opportunity to pay full price and it's yeah um, and looking at the value of, of the transformation of um, how it will also affect every other area of their life so with my uh, with mine for example the way we do money is the way we do everything so if we have weak boundaries around money we probably have weak boundaries in other areas as well Absolutely. if we have Absolutely. money avoidance yeah there's probably other areas of our yeah. life that we're uh, yeah we talked avoiding. about that a couple of weeks uh, about how to set boundaries and how to mm -hmm. put ourselves first and set ourselves as priorities because as women we and as moms we don't do that we we put everything else in front of, of ourselves yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. there's guilt around uh, guilt and shame yeah. around yeah. Uh, charging what we're worth, taking care of ourselves, valuing ourselves um, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, and there's nothing wrong with standing in your power and, and, and balancing that that masculine and feminine of, um, yeah, knowing exactly the value that you can offer and being able to do that. And because money is just an energy, an exchange, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it's not a dirty word. It is a thing just like a pen, you know, it's just, a, a number of piece of paper but we attach so much emotion to it that it can it can lead you to a disempowering state i know so, i know yeah so working through those money blocks so what's your uh, advice now um uh for women who you know are going through the parenting arrangement and want to get a, uh, get to a point where they're financially stable because you know women who are starting out like you know, you and I know that uh, starting out from a divorce um, or from leaving everything behind, it's not easy. So from a parenting parenting arrangement uh, perspective, what's your last advice for people before we close off tonight? Um, I'm not sure I can around parenting arrangements um, other than getting it in writing. 
because the what seems am am amicable to start with may not stay that way. And so I know a lot of women who, like my kids are 24 and 28 now, so it was such a long time ago for me that I went through that. Um, but my biggest regret was not getting it in writing because what we agreed on, um, it, it wasn't stuck to within a very, very short period of time and had to do everything on my own. And remembering that uh, we're talking, it could be a, it could be 10 years. It could be like you were saying with it, if you've got a two-year-old, in my case, it was three and five, mm -hmm. then that arrangement's got to be around for, you know, could be 10, 15, 18 years. And who knows what's going to happen, yeah. especially if, if, if your ex gets remarried yeah, and then there's a new, true. you know, a new, and has, and it has a new family that is, is not going to be so keen on paying that child support. So it's got, you've got to get it in writing and have it um, enforced. And so that it's, and, and so that it's done by the third parties so that you're not having those arguments and having to constantly fight for what was agreed upon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's great advice from from on my on my part. Um, my advice would be, if you're not going to go through the legal, um, like the courts, and you're going through um, mediation, mm -hmm. still make sure that you have those uh, arrangements notarized. Yeah. So that it's a legal document, because you Correct. never know yeah. what can happen. Like Michelle said, your ex can get married again, or you know you don't know what can happen so definitely get it notarized if you're not going through the courts but if you're going through the courts um there is um in, in ontario we have the family responsibility office i think that's what i did back then but i think the name has changed i don't know what it's changed to but it is um uh registered so the court your court document is registered with the family responsibility office and you don't have to go fighting your ex for for the for the support, it um, they're making sure that it's enforced. Mm -hmm. So in yeah. either way, make sure that you have a legal document. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank and you so if, much, if, Michelle. If, I know that you, I mean, you raised your son as a single mom as well. So I know, I know you understand exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for our sure. Facebook uh, viewers tonight. And uh, we'll catch you next week with another awesome topic. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.